Welcome to Matins on this Thursday of the fourth week of Easter. And the season is just flying by, is it not? So our scriptures for today, we're going to read the second half of Psalm 147. We'll move into Exodus chapter 34, and we'll finish up 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So, glad you're here with me this morning as we continue our journey through the word. Um, thank you for uh, giving God this time. So before we jump into it, I'd like us to begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Bless us, O God, with a reverent sense of your presence, that we may be at peace and may worship you with all our mind and spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Oops, clicked something wrong. So let me pull up our liturgy here. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. O oh, come, let us worship him. Alleluia. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. That brings us to our psalm. <clears throat> we have... Psalm number 147. Yesterday we did the first half. Today we'll read the second half. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down his crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. God, our Father, great builder of the heavenly Jerusalem, you know the number of the stars and call each of them by name. Heal hearts that are broken, gather those who have been scattered, and enrich us all from the plenitude of your eternal wisdom. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. That... Now brings us to our lessons. Oops, should have stayed there. <laughs> okay, so we are in chapter 34, and this is about Moses making new tablets. Uh, today we're going to read verses 1 through 17. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by, by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze up opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first 
And he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, Please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. And he said, Behold, I am making a covenant. Before all your people I will do marvels, such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their asherim, for you shall worship no other god. For the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. You shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so the people had made those gold, the golden calf, right? Aaron had done it, tried to avoid accepting responsibility. Moses smashed the tablets of the covenant. So still need the tablets, still need to have the written law. So God is telling him, make two more tablets. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Now, I don't take this as God saying, Moses did anything wrong, but Moses lost his temper. He got angry, just as the Lord had been angry, and Moses kind of pleaded on behalf of the people to not carry out God's anger. But Moses got angry, I think, on God's behalf. God is still telling him, be ready by morning, I will, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, present yourself there to me. Don't let anybody come up with you. Let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Don't let flocks or herds graze on. This is, this is a repeat of the original, the first time Moses went up the mountain. Nobody else can come up, just you. Moses did it, got up in the morning, did what he commanded him, took those two tablets of stone. The Lord descended on the cloud, stood with him there. That's very much a repeat of the first time God gave the covenant to Moses. Stood with him there. This is fascinating to me. This, this idea of in that period of time, God physically standing with his, um, with his spokesperson. God is omnipresent. We must remember that. But here his presence was localized and partially visible to Moses in the cloud. You know, the cloud was... Um, evidence of his presence and probably masked some of his actual presence so that Moses wouldn't be killed by God's pure righteousness and amazing glory. The Lord proclaimed, God, the Lord descended in the cloud, stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Um, we don't actually know what was said other than probably something like, I am the Lord your God. The Lord passed before him. All right. So this is some of that ancient um, linguistic pattern that we don't, we don't really speak like that, right? We don't really use those particular phrases. Um, 
All right, let's see. Um, so he identified himself by name, making this a personal encounter, fulfilled his promise from chapter 33, 19, which was, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will, pro and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. So he is doing exactly what he said he would do. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Interesting. So what's the difference between forgiving and clearing? Have you ever thought about that? What's the difference between forgiving and clearing? Forgiving means that God removed and forgot sin because of Christ, the coming Messiah. Hmm. Iniquity and transgression and sin. All right. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. These overlapping words for sin showed that this description referred to all human sin. Right? Oh, sorry about my mouse wandering there. Um, Trans iniquity is guilt that accompanied sin. Transgression is rebellion against God, and sin is any violation of God's law. That's a really good breakdown of the difference between those words. All right. Clear the guilty. God did not simply forget sin. Its penalty was to be paid by either the sinner or by a sacrifice. Hmm. Well, I will not clear the guilty. It will have to be paid by the sinner or a sacrifice. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Okay. This is a Hebrew expression that means that sin will have continuing effect. Okay. Iniquity. Remember what's iniquity? Guilt that accompanied sin. Okay. Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped quickly <laughs> he appropriately acknowledges god's presence here and identity by responding to his glory and his self-revelation yeah of course he did god if i found favor in your sight please let the lord go in the midst of us wow for we are a stiff let the people see your presence god again as they recognized your presence when you led us through the um through the, the waters of the sea when you parted them. Let them see your presence again. For it is a stiff-necked people. Remember when we read about that? Let me, let me just refresh us here. Go back to chapter 32, verse 9, where the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. A yoke or haltered animal might tighten its neck muscles to resist having its head turned to go in a new direction. Israel didn't want to go in the new direction that God was leading them, right? They are stiff-necked. Pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. So what Moses is asking is really what God wants anyway, right? This is what God wants. He wants his people. Can you, can you forgive us, God? The covenant renewed. This was, these tablets were the, the visible, physical sign of the covenant, right? I'm your God. You are my people. Here's how I want you to live. You need these rules. God says, behold, I'm making a covenant before your people, all your people. I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. Think about what God has already done with the, the plagues, right? Just for these people, you know, to say nothing of creation itself and the, um, and the flood with Noah the Tower of Babel, you know, everything God has done prior to this. At the very least, these people have seen these massive plagues that, in, that affected all of Egypt, um, the parting of the Red Sea, you know, the escape from Egypt. I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. Okay. All right. So, 
Israel broke the covenant in idolatry. That's what we read about in the golden calf, right? Since they could not repair the damage of their sin, God restored the covenant. Mm, pardon me. He's not giving up on his people. That's important. There is gr huge grace there. Okay. Yeah. Marvels, of course, are signs of God's almighty power. Oh, <clears throat> I apologize. <clears throat> all right. And all the people among you, among whom you are, right? Who's that? Well, we're going to see the list here in a second. Shall see the work of the Lord. All these marvels, they'll see it. It is an awesome thing that I will do with you. It's going to amaze and, and drive people to awe, true awe. Observe what I command you this day. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you. And here's the people among whom you are. Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. These are tribes, non-Hebrew tribes, non-Israelite tribes that were just, that's who was living there when God brought them out of Egypt. Now, don't make a covenant with them lest it become a snare in your midst, lest it trap you, lest it bring you, lest it draw you away from me, your God, lest it drive you to break my law. <clears throat> you shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their asherim. You see the note there, asherim are religious objects. Um, let's, let's scroll this up here a little bit. So Asherah was one of the pagan one of the pagan gods. Um, where's my note here? Asherah was associated with the Babylonian god Ishtar, um, associated with the sea, but honored most as the goddess of fertility. Canaanite goddess, the most important of the Canaanite goddesses, commonly the sister and wife of the storm god Baal. Ugh. Okay. So, yeah, there's all kinds of mythology to go with Baal and Asherah, right? And the Asherim, if you ever see I am on the end of a word in the Old Testament, that's a plural, right? So these are statues. These are idols. These are, um, yeah. So there would be an altar and a pillar with uh, an image of Asherah on it. And they were all over that land, right? You can still find ruins of cities with these pagan statues to their their pagan gods um a lot of them had to do with fertility because fertility was important in those days there was a lot of death they didn't have good medicine fertility was important both for um the building up of the people and you know and they also thought of it in terms of crops and and livestock so fertility was huge that's one of the reasons she was um one of their most important goddesses, but you got to tear all that down when you get there, Israel, because I'm your God and you will worship no other God. Look at this. The Lord whose name is jealous with a capital J. Wow. His very name is jealous. All right. Now it's taking us back to chapter 20. Let's just look at that note real fast. Chapter 20, verse five says this, you shall not bow down to them that is a carved image or an idol or serve them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So jealous is an adjective used, especially of God associated with with terms for zealous and passionate. God prohibits worshiping other gods because as any, in any good marriage, the relationship does not admit third parties. This is not sinful jealousy, but a righteous desire for his people to be faithful. Any, any husband or wife would expect this of their spouse. There's no room for a third partner. My very name is jealous. I'm a jealous God. Don't make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land when they 
whore after their gods, right? Look at that verb there. <clears throat> Israel was married to God. This is, this is an ongoing theme, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. Okay, this is not, this is very, com this is the kind of relationship that God wants to have with his people. Okay, to worship another God is to commit adultery against your spouse. That's the, co that's the comparison he's making here. They're going to go after other gods, and they're going to sacrifice to their gods, and they're going to invite you because you're their neighbor, and they want to, you know, they don't necessarily want to war with you. But if you eat the sacrifice to another god, if you let their, whoops, if you let their daughters marry your sons, their daughters will likely worship their gods and convince their sons, convince your sons to do the same because they're now married to them, right? don't let your daughters, don't let your sons marry their daughters. Don't do it because of this worship of pagan gods. It will cause our society to be tainted. It will affect our faith negatively. That's what God is telling Moses here. You shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. This is what got them in trouble. These cast metal, this, you know, the golden calf. Don't do it. It will only lead to me, your God, being angry, and it will cause ruin to fall on the people. So, and you can see the law continues there, but that's for tomorrow. So let's go to the New Testament. First Thessalonians chapter two. We'll read the remainder of the chapter starting at verse 13. St. Paul writes, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, right, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. But since we were torn away from you brothers for a short time in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Let's back up a little bit. <coughs> so, Paul's reminding them the good stuff that's been done already, that they've received the gospel, and that they're living according to it, right? They're doing well, and Paul's proud of them. And we also thank God constantly for this, right? That you, you know, well, he's talking here about, here's how we behaved toward you. We were holy and righteous and blameless, right? And we thank God for that. That when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men. In other words, the word of human beings who are not God, but it's what it really is, which is the word of God. Okay. So again, what's Paul talking about here? He's addressing false teachers. The true word of God came through Paul and Silvanus and Timothy and Paul and Silvanus and Timothy were righteous and holy and blameless in their conduct with this church. And that is Paul's appeal to them to say, look, look how we behaved versus look how these false teachers are behaving. They're charlatans. They steal from you. They're in it for greedy purposes. We are not. Remember, I think before this, he was talking about how we didn't even expect you to support us, right? Um, we didn't flatter you. 
We, there was no pretext of greed. We were gentle among you, right? We worked. We worked outside of the ministry to support ourselves so that we wouldn't be a burden to you, right? There was no greed here. These people are taking your money and they're teaching you false things, things that might be nice to hear, but are not true. And because it is the word of God and not just mere human beings, it is at work in you believers. The word is at work in you. For you, brothers and sisters, right? Inclusive term. It means everybody. All of you in this church became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. The other churches that were begun before you, but are living the same gospel that are that are um, that have received the word of god and are living their lives accordingly you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the jews okay what's going on here this is a gentile community they are surrounded by pagans who do not share their faith and those pagans did not want to hear this some of them didn't want to hear this gospel so they kind of persecuted this, these new Christians, just like the ones in Judea did from the Jews who are the same Jews who crucified Christ, who, when, you know, when you read Acts, they follow Paul and try to get in the way of his, him spreading the gospel. He's arrested several times. He's stoned once and survives. These Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, many times prophets like Jeremiah. Jeremiah did not bring good news to God's people. He brought bad news. Um, he, not necessarily one of the ones he's referring to, Paul's referring to here, but there were other prophets who were killed because they did not bring good, they did not tell the people what they wanted to hear. They told the people God's message that was unpleasant and drove us out. These same Jews drove out Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. And these same Jews displease God and oppose all mankind. God's wish for mankind is that we would receive the gift of God's grace in Jesus, but these Jews stand against the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of that, they're getting in the way of the salvation of the whole world. That means they oppose all mankind. They are not working for the good of humanity. They are working for their own selfish purposes. They hinder us from speaking to the Gentiles that these Gentiles could be saved. The Jews are getting in the way of that. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, they are just being sinful. But wrath has come upon them at last. All right. I got to look this one up because I don't, I don't know. There's apparently an event that Paul is referring to. All right. Um, some scholars have tried to connect this wrath with certain historical events that were about to happen, like the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. But the verb's past tense stresses the certainty of wrath in the future. So has come upon them like it's already happened, okay? Therefore, it can be considered as complete. Hmm. So there's really not one event, but Paul is certain that wrath has come. Since we were torn away from you, the Jews chased them out for a short time, physically, but not spiritually. That's what this means. We are still with you in, in spirit. We are with you and you are with us. We are together in our hearts. We endeavored the more eagerly and you know, with great desire to see you face to face. I wanted to come back. We wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again, I wanted to come. I wanted to come. I really did. I wanted to be with you, but Satan got in the way. He acknowledges the work of the evil foe. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus that is coming? It's you, the church that was built in his name because of his word and his Holy Spirit. We can show when Christ comes back, which Paul thoroughly believed was happening soon. Right? He this, is, this is the sign that they are doing the work of the kingdom and the kingdom is growing. The body of Christ is growing, and it is churches like the church at Thessalonica that are evidence of the work that Paul and Silvanus and Timothy and the other apostles are doing in the name of the Lord Jesus at his command 
following his will. You are our glory and our joy. They have joy in Christ because they can see the growing and the prospering of the gospel. Amen and amen. All right, that is a good place to stop. We'll pick up there tomorrow at, at chapter three. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets, but now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. This is the day that the Lord has made. Alleluia. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty savior, born of the house of his servant, David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Alleluia. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Let us pray. Father, in restoring human nature, you have given us a greater dignity than we had in the beginning. Keep us in your love, and continue to sustain those who have received new life in baptism. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Now let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O oh Lord, I cry to you for help. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Let my mouth be full of your praise and your glory all the day long. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness, O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He redeems my life from the grave and crowns me with mercy and loving kindness. Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come before you. Let us pray once more. O Lord Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. That, brothers and sisters, concludes our matins for this Thursday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me. Thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Uh, we will have matins again tomorrow. So hope you can join me for that. And I hope you have a blessed Thursday. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.